So we'll start our presentation on robotic assisted by cruise sheet retaining total knee replacement. I'm a professor at University of Hawaii. And my disclosures are I'm a consultant for Smith Nephew, OrthoGrid, and also VR. And this is a passion project for me. I'm a 55 year old with knee arthritis and I still have my ACL. So I started working on the design of this implant in 2004. We put our first by cruciate knee in a patient in 2014. So this is uh, combined with the technology, something I've been really focused on in my career. So I think we should be reminded that bicruciate knees can be successful. Certain designs are better than others, but the Cloutier knee and the Townley knee have 80 to 90% survivorship at 20 years. And these are the old style knees with cobalt chrome and non crosslink polyethylene. And if you combine proper indications, an excellent implant, and intelligent technology, you can have excellent results. So the indications are fairly straightforward. Basically, someone who has medial or lateral compartment arthritis or even patellofemoral arthritis, but one additional compartment has gone bad. So more than what you could accomplish with either a uni or a PFJ. So this patient has medial and patellofemoral arthritis, and they've done well with a resurfacing implant that by cruciate sparing total knee. And the advantages are faster recovery, better range of motion, and for the athletic population, retention of proprioception and a more natural feel to the knee. So when I think about indications, I look at four things, deformity, soft tissue, BMI, and bone stock. This really works best for someone who has minimal deformity, less than 10 degrees of varus and less than seven degrees of valgus. Ideally, this is a correctable deformity and they have a less than 10 degree flexion contracture with intact ACL and PCL. Better for a BMI less than 35 because of the tibial base plate, it's a short stem. And I'll show you an image of that keel and they should have good bone stock. So typical patient, 5'1", 135, pickleball player with medial and patellofemoral disease. This is the bicruciate retaining knee replacement and this is her at six weeks post-op. This is a larger patient. He's a softball player. Again, medial and patellofemoral disease. This is his post-operative x-ray. And you can see it really is a bone conserving implant. And this is him immediately post-op, about 100 degrees of flexion, and then about 125, 130 at six weeks. Now, the first question is, is the ACL present? Of course, you'll get that on history and physical exam. X-rays are instructive. If the femur is sitting posterior and you have more of a posterior pattern of where the ACL is likely insufficient, you want to see the femur located anteriorly directly over the tibia and have more of an anterior wear pattern. So contraindications looking at it the same way, larger than 15 degrees of varus or 10 degrees of valgus with a fixed deformity is too much. A large flexion contracture more than 10 degrees where you might have to elevate the joint line is really difficult to deal with. And of course, an inflammatory arthropathy is no good. Use caution with BMI over 35, although I've done it in larger patients as well. And I don't like this as a revision procedure from a uni. I think that you should have really pristine tibial bone for excellent tibia fixation. Can you do it in a patient who's had an ACL reconstruction? You can if it's a good ACL reconstruction. This you can see has vertical tunnels. It's a non-anatomic ACL reconstruction. She doesn't have good rotational stability. So we did better with her with a bicruciate substituting design. So implant design is important and the failures I think are related to a non-anatomic femur. So fighting the femoral shape of the implant and tibia base plate design, either the tibia base plates can fracture or they can loosen. So the design of this new implant is improved upon the failures that we've seen prior. So the femur is anatomic and it's an asymmetric CR type design with a larger radius of curvature medially than laterally. And the tibia base plate has this large keel, so it's like an I-beam, so it's very, very stiff and very sturdy. And the shape of the tibia surface is concave medially and convex laterally. And we've mirrored this in the shape of the tibial polyethylene. 
And if you reproduce this normal anatomy with normal shapes and you get the femur located anteriorly over the tibia, then you can get normal kinematics and appropriate rotation as you go into flexion. Now, the key thing to note is that this is a much less constrained tibia polyethylene, so the ligaments really drive the motion. And for this reason, it's intolerant of raising or lowering the joint line. And this is why technology is very important to us. And the MCL and LCL balance is like doing a medial and a lateral uni. And we know we balance our medial uni different than our lateral uni, so you have to be mindful of balancing each compartment of the knee differently for a successful operation. So we use the Cori system that you just so nicely demonstrated with computer-aided design, dynamic gap balancing, and robotic-assisted milling. So we have very precise execution of our three-dimensional plan. So a typical patient, he's 47 years old, a young fella, six foot four, he's a basketball player, and he drives the tugboat and helps unload the containers that come to our island. So he has tricompartmental disease. His major issue is patellofemoral disease, but he has enough problems in the medial and lateral compartment that a patellofemoral arthroplasty would not be sufficient. And his issues are trochlear dysplasia and lateral patella subluxation. So we have to think of all this when we're doing the surgery. So I prefer a surgery without a tourniquet. I like a subvastus approach. I think this really helps with less pain and improves patella tracking. And we use the TraumaCAD system to template our operation so we know what implants we're going to use. The approach, we want to do aggressive and precise osteophyte resection and minimal, minimal ligament release. And especially this is important for a valgus knee not to uh, loosen up the medial side too much. And the osteophyte resection releases tight ligaments, but also gives the Cori system more accurate sizing information. I put my trackers on the femoral side within the wound and on the tibia side outside the wound. Defining the center of the ankle, as you saw, is touching the medial and lateral malleoli, and then the machine calculates the center of the ankle. The center of the ACL footprint and the terminus of the trochlea determine the center of the knee at the tibia and the femur, respectively, and this is us collecting that data. And then rotating the hip in small circles gives us the center of the hip. So now we have the alignment in the system, and I want to generally undercorrect these patients and restore their prearthritic alignment, their prearthritic shape of their knee. And we define our initial range of motion, as you saw. We do that with a slight axial load. We uh, map the femur. Again, this is all very standard. We just trace the outline of the femur. It brings up a mesh that's from the CT database. And then we refine the mesh. And I think what's elegant about the system is that it's real-time 3D map mapping of the cartilage surface. You're not working off a CT scan. You're working off the cartilage surface, which is really the actual joint line location. So it takes about 40 to 45 seconds. The tibia is mapped the same way. But what's unique about this is we are careful not to map the ACL footprint. And we use special points to identify <clears throat> the rotational alignment of the ACL footprint. Because this implant is going to be relatively internally rotated, typically we externally rotate the tibia component at least five degrees, and this component matches the rotation of the ACL footprint, just like a medial uni or a lateral uni. So it's going to appear internally rotated to your eye. So when you prioritize the information, you have a lot of information with these robotic systems. If you're doing a bicruciate substituting knee or posterior stabilized knee, you're having a large deformity. So I'm focusing on correcting the alignment, and I'm looking at my measured resection. I want to take, for example, 9.5 millimeters off the medial distal femoral cut to accommodate my implant. I'll look at the gap balancing information, but I'll be focusing primarily on the less affected side. So with this anatomic implant, if I get my lateral side balanced correctly, the medial side will end up where it needs to go. And then the shape matching is less important because it's a deformity to start with. And I'm also gonna be doing some more ligament releases. With the Baikushi retaining design, we're primarily shape matching. We're focusing on that three-dimensional image and really resurfacing the knee to restore the prearthritic anatomy. Gap balancing is really important because it's different medially and laterally, and I'll show you how. And then I'm going to undercorrect, so I'm less focused on the raw numbers of the alignment, although I want to stay within three degrees for longevity.
So with a bicruciate substituting design or a PS design, you're going to go for the largest thermal component without overhang because you really want to have a nice balanced gap and extension and inflection. And our goal for this implant is even gaps at one millimeter medially and laterally in extension. And we're going to externally rotate the femur aggressively three to five degrees. So we're really appropriately tight in that lateral compartment and we have a nice rectangular gap in flexion. With the XR, the bicruciate retaining knee, we're generally careful to match precisely the posterior femoral offset. Now with the medial uni, I like two millimeters gap, meet in extension and in flexion. And on a lateral uni, I like three millimeters gap in extension, and I want it to gradually open up to seven millimeters in flexion. So you can imagine when you put a knee in a figure of four, you stick an arthroscope in there, it's gonna open up nicely, and you can put a 4.5 or five millimeter shaver in there with plenty of room. So that trapezoidal flexion gap is our goal here. And for this reason, we don't add a lot of external rotation to the femur. We just match the anatomy of the patient. So it's usually only one or two degrees. And we can balance our extension gap by adding varus one or two degrees uh, to balance the extension gap. Now, the initial implant placement on that first quarry screen is shape matching. So in general, we'll undercorrect the coronal alignment I like to correct valgus knees to neutral, but varus knees I'll undercorrect by one, two, or three degrees. And the rotation is not aggressive, but you see here that we're really matching exactly the shape of those posterior condyles. On the tibia, again, very important to match the less affected joint line. This is an asymmetric implant that's 11 millimeters thick laterally and eight millimeters thick medially. So this, this knee with a varus uh, wear, you know, we're going to be adding a little material back medially, but we're matching the normal joint line on this varus knee. Rotation of the tibia component is going to match the rotational alignment of the ACL footprint. And this asymmetric component fits the bone very nicely. And the sagittal adjustment, we really want to make sure that, again, we're matching the posterior femoral offset. And I like posterior slope to be five degrees on these implants. If you put too much posterior slope, then the tibia will want to go forward. It'll put a lot of strain on your ACL and could lead to early failure. So five degrees is appropriate. And then we have done our preliminary placement of the implants, which takes about one minute. And then we uh, stress the knee, range the knee, varus and valgus stress using a Z retractor to augment our stress. And we get a curve like this. And then we can fine tune our, our balance based on these numbers. So in this case, it looks like on the medial side, I'm a little bit looser than I'd like to be. So I can move my femoral component a little distal and um, perhaps a little tighter medially in flexion than I'd like to be. So we've adjusted our femoral component position, and we can look at this curve here, and we can see that, again, our, our flexion, our lateral side, which is purple, is gradually opening up as we go into deep flexion. But even doing the best I can, I'm still rather tight in extension laterally. And that's what you'd expect for a valgus knee. So I'm gonna keep an eye on that for later and be, okay, I'm mindful of this, and I know that I'll get some release of the IT band as I do the procedure, but I might have to pie crust it. So we use a milling tool. I like the Allbur technique that I learned from Dr. Gerani and Dr. Vredia. And it's very efficient. And you can see here, we're not looking at a classic grand piano sign. This is a less externally rotated femoral component. But I just systematically remove the bone from top to bottom, use a tunneling technique to get the posterior condyles. And then for the tibia, I like a milling tool. I don't like using the saw because I'm worried about undermining that ACL. So I go from top to bottom anteriorly and then use the tunneling technique, as you can see here, to remove the bone posteriorly. And then I also like to use the bird to clean out my keel space. I wanna have a three to four millimeter cement mantle around that keel for optimum fixation. So you have plenty of room. A lot of people are worried, can I clean out the back of the knee? You have great exposure, you can clean out the back of the knee. The implant is a standard CR implant and you see lots of space available for the ACL, and this U-shaped tibia component cradles the ACL as well. Now, I'm a little tight uh, with that IT band. I couldn't quite get a full correction, so I just did a little pie crusting watching the screen. I made sure I can get full extension easily, and then we corrected that, and we see that on the final screen we got our neutral alignment. We have this information that we use uh, and we review each week. It's helpful with the fellows and the residents, but it's also good for our data collection. And this is a post-operative film. So you get nice full extension. 
It's a really bone conserving prosthesis. This is what I love about this implant. And this is him immediately after surgery. He goes home the same day. This is him at four weeks post-op. And these patients really recover like a uni. They recover much more like a uni than a total. And they get back to pretty high levels of activity. So the challenge in my practice is surfers. Surfers love to surf. You have to flex your knee to 155 to pop up. You have to have great mid-flexion stability to surf. And you have to have proprioception to surf well. And this is a a high-level surfer and surfboard shaper. And again, pretty moderate arthritis. I tried everything to talk him out of a knee replacement and did injections, but still he had recurrent effusions and pain. So this is an operation where I feel confident that I can restore his level of function that he's looking for. This is our planning screen, and again, varus wear. So we're matching the cartilage surface on the lateral side, but adding a little material back on the uh, worn medial side to the cartilage surface, matching that joint line. You can see this rotation is matching the ACL footprint. This is his post-operative x-ray. This is him going home the same day. He has good quad control because we do the sub approach. And this is him back surfing. So I know that I've done a good job and I see him out surfing all the time. So I think if you have good indications, a good implant, and use technology. You're going to have an excellent outcome with a bicruciate retaining knee. And be wary of doing a bicruciate retaining knee if you don't absolutely love the ACL and the PCL. So this system, you can convert very quickly and easily to a cruciate retaining, retaining that PCL, or substitute for the ACL and the PCL. So I'd rather have a perfect bicruciate substituting knee than an imperfect bicruciate retaining knee. Our patients have high expectations. We now have these great implants and using technology really lets us hit the target every time. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate the chance to participate in this conference.